you're looking at the new Core One L from Prusa. You might think you're looking at just a larger Core One. Certainly it's implied by the name, but you'd be wrong to assume that's all that this is. There's a fair bit to talk about. Let's go. Let's get some admin out of the way first. The Prusa Core One L was sent to me by Prusa at no cost. They have actually not told me what to do with it. I just assumed that a review would be the logical thing. So all opinions are mine. As usual, I've put links down below in the description for the Core One and Core One L. If you do decide to go and buy one, then please use those because those are affiliate links and that helps support the work that I do. The Core One L is 300 by 300 by 330 millimeters, which may not sound much larger than the original Core One, but when you put them side by side, you can see it's really not a negligible difference at all. The new Core One L kind of dwarfs the old one. The internal volume is doubled, and everything looks quite uniformly scaled, which can look a bit strange if you've been using the Core One for a while and suddenly you've got a bigger one. Although, I have to say, after using the L for the last few weeks, I kind of feel like it's a nicer size for most people, if you can afford it. More about that later. Might as well start with the biggest thing for me on the Core One L. It is right in front of our eyes. Or it is if you take off the print sheet. This is exactly what it looks like. A very thick slab of aluminium. If you're not that familiar with machines, um, generally, you won't necessarily recognize how unusual this is. To my mind, I can't think of another machine outside of a self-built one, like a Voron, that uses this kind of bed. If you're thinking, is that a big deal? Yes, it's a big deal. You're seeing the bed through Fleur, and if I was feeling productive, you might be seeing a time lapse of it heating up. The bed on the Core One L is also mains for the first time ever, so the combination of the conductivity of the aluminium, the mains heating, and the relatively huge thermal mass should give us much better performance. And that should, which is the big deal in all this, that should run right up to the corners of the bed. There's also a couple of fans that you wouldn't know about until you start a print when they make a mysterious noise. These in theory are supposed to increase the speed that the printer heats up and also in theory they should allow the cavity of the printer to maintain a higher temperature overall because they can spread the heat from the bed faster. Not that the Core One particularly couldn't because it absolutely could but the Core One L with these extra features can now print just about all the usual materials that you would expect it to. This is new too. The Core One had a vent in the top and you had to open and close it yourself. You could print in the Core One with PLA, PTG with the door closed. That's not changed. The vent is bigger, which again is kind of strange because they've just scaled it up, but the L has no user controls. You can do it manually with your hand from the inside, but there's actually no need anymore. This is the simplest approach to the problem in my opinion, and as far as I'm aware, this idea actually originated in the community. The machine knows what filament is loaded, so 
Based on that, it opens or closes the vent at the start of the print. As I said, you can print with the door closed for PLA and PETG on the Core 1L, just as you can with the Core 1. There is a camera now included by default in the Core 1L, and I believe you get a spare hardened nozzle, and that's almost it for features. I think one more thing on this machine that is not on the Core 1, and that is this on the filament input line. This is a switch which supposedly reduces the tension for TPU and other flexible filaments, which you can use on particularly stubborn filaments for loading and printing, and I can confirm that makes it easier to load the filament, although I didn't actually have any problems either way with actually printing the filament, even down to 40D or 85A, I tried both. I recently made a short on a new feature that made it to the core one, but it's also in the L. This is a function that uses stroboscopy, I think I've pronounced that correctly, and resonance of the belt to set the correct belt tension. It looks really cool, but if you want to know about how it works, I hate repeating myself, so I'll link you to the short in question in the description. It's very clever and it's surprisingly accurate. The idea behind this is to help out with the things we're calling VFAs that most printers are plagued with these days. I think we almost have a joke in the hobby now, or perhaps we need one. Um, something along the lines of, if your printer doesn't have VFAs, then maybe it's time for an eye test. I'll get my coat. Inside of the machine is pretty unsurprising, it's the same mostly as the Core 1. Uh, to get the back panel off you have to remove one internal screw, same as the Core 1, I had to do this the other day to fit the MMU. Then you remove the Wi-Fi thingy off the bottom so that it doesn't snap the legs when you pull the panel off, and then you pull the panel off. But I, I can't actually show you inside the power supply below it because, well, unusually I had to give up. It seems like there's three screws on the left hand side here that are only accessible with a fairly significant disassembly of the machine. I don't particularly know why you can't have screws on the front of this panel. There might be a reason, I don't understand it. I don't think there's a huge reason why you would need to get into the power supply most of the time, except of course if you need to replace the fan here because they fail or they get noisy. So I think this definitely could have been designed for better access and it sort of feels a bit Unpruser-ish, if that makes sense. A lot of the stuff in this video feels quite disjointed because I'm trying to pull things from various times and places that don't necessarily relate, and that made this um, this video quite hard to put together. But anyway, this is yet another random thing inserted into this video. If you haven't, um, and your printer supports it, I strongly recommend trying Prusa Easy Print. One of the massive advantages to the Core One L and the Core 1 and every other Prusa printer is exactly how well integrated it is into the Prusa ecosystem, but EasyPrint actually supports all sorts of printers. A lot of the prints for this review have been done on EasyPrint. You might think you can't possibly slice and print in a web browser, but as long as your needs are pretty straightforward and not things like uh, vase mode or unusual filaments or um, paint on supports, I don't think it does, I, I haven't actually checked, you can actually potentially slice and print without ever opening a slicer. I think you have to really use it to understand how easy it is, the name is a hint, so I suggest giving it a go. Anyway, I want to talk about some downsides, uh, two mainly. The first ought to be pretty blatantly obvious that this is a single colour machine, or is it? You see, the Core 1 and correspondingly the Core 1L both support the Prusa MMU. You thought I was going to say index. I'm getting to that. This is the core box. It's a third party add on that's actually been designed by one of the channel's patrons, so it's been on my radar for a while. And while I'm not that quick at building stuff, I'm glad I finally got a chance to build this and show you how cool it is, just in time for the index release. But never mind that. I want to show you this because, to my mind, it solves one of the biggest downsides of the Prusa MMU, which is, well, the sprawling mass of tubes and reels behind it. Corebox puts all five reels, not four, five, on top of the Core 1, and watch this. That was not motor powered. There's a mod to add motor, but you don't need it. What you see here is the MMU pushing the reel back and winding it back up. This is all insanely clever, and it's due to a friction mechanism internally. I think Prusa themselves might have been more interested in pursuing a solution something like this. Maybe they were. They, they did hint at that kind of thing. Had it not been for something else that came completely out of the blue. 
Side note, Corebox is about to be available for the Core 1 L2, probably about the same time as the release of this video. And that thing that came along that we all saw last week was, of course, Bond Tech's new Index inductive tool changing system. If you don't know about Bond Tech's Index system, then maybe you've been under a rock. Index was the biggest announcement of 2025, and it is almost certainly set to be the biggest product of 2026 when it finally comes out. Or that's my prediction. Index supports the Core 1, not the L, from day one, whenever that is. And aside from it being a kit that you have to do an as yet unknown amount of work to fit it to a Core 1, we don't know whether that's an hour's work or four hours work at this time, I don't think. Once you do that, you have one of the most advanced tool changer setups available to, well, anyone really i think and if you're thinking how do i store this many reels which is going to be up to eight to be specific on a core one well sander the guy who made core box might have you back there too you can hang them on a printer they they do by default hang on the side of the printer i think from from the footage we've seen and that's actually fine but how cool is inbox i don't actually know how to pronounce it sorry i'm, I'm not sure if there is a pronunciation if you want to know more about this, and you probably will, especially if you're one of the first thousand people to have ordered Index, I will put links in the description, so go check them all out. So back to downsides. The second downside is that to buy the Core 1 L, you have to be, well, you have to be able to afford it. The printer is not cheap. A lot of printers aren't cheap now, so it doesn't exactly stand out that much among, among the high price printers. I am a bit of a cheapskate myself, mostly. So I have to admit that a printer that costs a penny under £1,700 at time of release is... it's a hard sell for a lot of us. I do think that, like the camera I just showed you, there's some expectations of price and some expectations of quality. Could they have made the printer for £1,400? I think they could, if they'd taken out probably everything that I actually like about it. And if we stick to the camera analogy for a bit longer, the camera on the left is Ender 3 V3 priced, and the camera on the right is probably Core 1 L priced, give or take. You could very well argue that I can run this entire channel with just the left one. And I kind of did for about a year, and before that I was running on things worse than that, but as I grew the channel I moved through several other models of camera until I realised that this one, this one is worth the money and it continues to deliver results that I could not get with the cheaper one, or it would just be a lot more work to do that. What does that have to do with the Core 1 L? The Core 1 L, I'm quite convinced, is worth the price, just like the camera, but this is something that often isn't apparent to someone who hasn't ever used it. We're used to this line of thinking with things like cameras, cars, shoes, especially shoes. Nobody ever really argues about it for those things, really. You never have people saying, why do you spend so much money on your shoes? But for some reason, it's something we still argue about a lot with printers, and that's food for thought, I think. Do I think the Core 1 L is the printer you should buy right now? Well, if you can afford it and you're looking to add Index as it comes available as a kit, and you're willing to add it as a kit, then an L or a Core 1 would seem like an absolute no-brainer to me right now. I can only assume that Index will fit both, and Index on a Core 1 L is going to be a very formidable setup, possibly unbeatable. If you still want Index and don't want a kit, then who knows, maybe that one tweet that Joseph made about working on a factory Index fitted Core 1, or at least that's how I interpreted it, might be worth waiting around for, especially since you can't order Index right now anyway. So that's an interesting note to end on. Let me know what you think in the comments. We can also talk in the comments about the index since I'm probably not going to be able to cover it until I have one in my hands. That could be a while. And I think we're going to have a very exciting 2026 from the look of it. Make sure you like and subscribe. I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.